when I came to New York State, to, to the State Museum as an envir environmental biologist, back in 1979, part of the, the rationale for them hiring me as an environmental biologist was to begin to look at the impacts of acid deposition, see how the lakes were responding. The Adirondacks is one of the most heavily impacted areas of the state, if not the nation, as far as acid deposition goes and negative effects on, on the lakes. There's some uh, estimates back in the early 80s that roughly 25 percent of the lakes in, in the Adirondacks were so acidic they couldn't support fish. So at that point it was somewhere around 750, 800 lakes were already incapable of supporting fish. This exhibit on, on Brook Trout Lake uh, involves is, is a look at Brook Trout Lake over the past 25 years. As far as we know the last fish in Brook Trout Lake were, were found or collected in 1975. So uh, shortly after that, we, we think fish had died out completely. But back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, Brook Trout Lake, and I mean, the name sort of implies that you would have uh, a lot of fish in the lake. And it was a uh, destination for many of the float planes. So they would fly people in there, they'd fish all day, come back with trophy trout. So it was a very important fishery at one point. Uh, Brook Trout Lake was first visited in 1984. At that time, it, there were no fish living in the lake. It was a beautiful, clear water lake. I mean, it's one when you look at it, it was just gorgeous uh, color, almost a deep uh, cupric type color because of the, the clarity there. We were uh, doing synoptic studies. We're looking at a, br a large number of lakes in a relatively short number of time, uh, amount of time to try to determine what sort of patterns we could see in community structure. The, the phytoplankton, uh, base of the food chain, the algae, the organisms that fed on those, the zooplankton, and in some cases the benthos fish and plant life of, of the lake. So we could get a look at how patterns change in relation to acidity status of the lake. First thing I'll be doing is sampling the zooplankton. And zooplankton be a, they're a group of invertebrates that feed primarily on the algae. Some of them will feed on one another the predators, but uh, it's essentially the second rung of the food web here in, in a lake. And what we're using is this plankton trap that as you lower it into the water, the water pushes the bottom up and the top up. So you're just lowering it down. When you stop, they both fall and trap whatever's in this volume of water. And as you bring it up to the surface, you filter it through this fine mesh net. And then preserve what's in the in the bottom of this and so that what we've seen in this lake back in the back in the 80s when we first started sampling it was a very simple community there were lots of zooplankton in here but it was very simple just uh, three or four species through the year whereas now we're seeing as many as through the year uh, 14 species uh, maybe eight or ten of them that are common so it's much more diverse community it's not necessarily more abundant, but it's more diverse, different species yeah. that, that have come in. And that's one of the signs and one of the big impacts of acidification is that it reduces diversity in almost every community. Whether it's the algae, you get fewer algae species, you get fewer zooplankton species, fewer fish, and, uh, and that simplifies the community, makes it even more susceptible to perturbations. By the late 1990s, early 2000s, Brook Trout Lake was showing signs of some recovery. And that was reflected in changes in the transparency, how clear the water was. There was obviously more algae coming into the lake and the transparency was decreasing. And this is the, the mechanism used to measure transparency, water transparency. Just by lowering it into the water, measuring when it disappears and then when it reappears as you bring it up and the average is Secchi depth. In the 80s, you could see this 16 meters, so a little over 50 feet down into the water. Since, uh, since then, because the lake has begun to recover, there's a lot more algae, a lot more production, uh, sometimes you can only see this about 10 feet. So you've, you've reduced transparency tremendously, and that's an index of the amount of production occurring. Now that's important because photosynthesis by the algae, the process consumes some acidity as well. 
And then as all the algae dye sink to the bottom and decompose, the decomposition process can also consume some of the acidity. So you get a positive feedback loop that as recovery occurs, pH comes up, you get more algae. They increase the recovery process by consuming some of the acidity. So what I'm going to do is lower it and then record what that transparency is. Back in the 80s, you could see as deep as, uh, well, let's see, uh, 50 feet into the water. Uh, by the 2000s, you were lucky to see about 10 feet into the water because of all the algae that, that had begun to grow in, in the lake. Now, we also included not only the, the plankton community, uh, phytoplankton, algae, uh, zooplankton, uh, we're also looking at the bottom community. We brought in colleagues to look at some of the amphibians in the lake because those also are changing. And uh, biologists that, that study fish as well. So we get an idea of the fishery possibilities. In 2005, because the lake looked like it was recovering so well, the Department of Environmental Conservation planted fish, Brook Trout Lake, back into the lake, uh, re, uh, restocked the lake with fish. They, and they began the process by stocking 2,000 fingerling fish and about two dozen uh, broodstock, large, large brook trout, uh, to see how they would do. And they subsequently stocked additional fingerlings in the lake each of succeeding years since 2005. So uh, our, our fishery studies showed that they're growing very well, that the lake essentially is to the point where it can support the brook trout. There's a lot more that needs to be done yet. Uh, we still don't understand why Brook Trout Lake, rather than some of the other lakes, are showing this recovery. We believe it's all connected to the uh, positive feedback that comes from initially a little bit of recovery and then the biology of the lake starts to take over. So you get a cycle that begins to develop where the biological activities begin to help the chemical recovery. That it's not just chemical recovery, it's a biological chemical recovery that begins to occur.